Right, so now continuing, this will be the part two of Ahare, Ahare Mot or Kermotu Bechala Bamarinya. And so this is a likeness, this is a good likeness of um, the two sons of Aaron. So when we're reading the portion um, in Leviticus chapter 16, right, when we're reading this portion, in Leviticus chapter 16, it's saying to us, it's describing what took place in the previous Torah portion where it says, And Yahweh has spake to Musa, Moses, after the death of, of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before Yahweh and died. And Yahweh said to Musa, Speak to Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times to the holy place within the veil. Remember the veil, the whole theme in the New Testament of the veil, the tabernacle veil. And in a sense, this is a good likeness of the veil right here. Now, please note, if you will, the colors of the veil. The colors of the veil. Now, this is very, very important to take some notes of this. Please, brothers and sisters, disciples, please take a note of this and, 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 because it's going to be very important as 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 one put the the big picture so to speak together the veil has these distinctive colors right here you understand of blue and of red so it reminds us of the 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 matrix movie remember the red pill the blue pill and the red pill so it's a blue pill and there's a red pill now the colors have a have a particular significance because the colors ha have a particular meaning and this meaning what's interesting about this meaning it transcends almost all cultures. You understand? It transcends, even though in different religions, different cultures, there's a different maybe mythology or there's a different understanding. These colors are very significant. Blue always represents, we can call it the spiritual. You understand? These two colors are symbolic of what's known in ancient Egypt. Remember, it's out of Egypt that, that meant much of this mystery is founded on certain principles, some ancient Afro-Shemitic principles. Now, the blue and the red, the, the, the blue, one can say, symbolize heaven and the heavenly order. You understand? Um, and then we have the red. You understand? So on one level, we have, we have law, you understand, or, or the law of God on that level, the blue. And then we have red, which is sacrifice. Red, which which symbolizes now the sacrifice. Now, it's interesting. Remember the Matrix movie? In the Matrix movie, um, there's the blue pill, there's the red pill first, and there's the blue pill. And you remember what the the blue pill signified? In other words, you know, it's, it's almost like being under law. You understand? And the red pill, in that sense, is going down the so-called proverbial rabbit hole because the red symbolizes that sacrifice. Now, this particular Torah portion... This particular Torah portion, what is so interesting about this particular Torah portion is that first it concerns the Day of Atonement, and we're going to have to study that word atonement. Now, we look at the word at one meant. So we say today, at one meant is atonement. Well, that was only achieved in and through Yeshua. That was only achieved in and through you understand, in and through this particular sacrifice, that one sacrifice, that one sacrifice for all time. Now, of course, this is not this is not pleasant to see. This is not pleasant to look upon, especially we as black men recognizing that lynching, you understand, that, that, that lynching and the whole fact that black male is a crime, that lynching was all part of this. You understand they're all part and parcel of it. So we would better understand who we are, our birthright, our heritage, the fact that we are lost sheep. And we put the picture together. It all begins to make um, spiritual, you understand, on some levels beautiful, but some levels very shocking. It, it, it comes to the point where you really begin to, when you, as you understand, you say that the Almighty, that Jah is truly awesome. You know what I'm saying? And even in, 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 in his majesty is terrible, but yet we also recognize that mercy triumphs over judgment, which is one of the foundational principles that you need to understand, that mercy triumphs over judgment. But that does not mean there is no judgment, but that is mercy. You know, first the judge 
he has to first sentence, and, and not sentence, but first they have to convict somebody, go through the trial, so forth and so on. And afterward, that person is, is said, you're guilty, and this is what your, your crimes deserve. And then the judge might, if, if the law permits the judge, might be able to give some mercy. But the judgment must come. You see, the judgment must come. Now, the blue and the red and the sacrifice here all point to the Day of Atonement, but it points to Christos, that Yeshua now, you understand, in the true fulfillment. Remember, atonement of the ancient Beit Israel, they used bulls and goats and, and sheep and rams and, and birds as sacrificial types. You understand? Or sacrificial types. So when we interpret the atonement of Christos, you understand? And this is also connected with the whole, the real meaning of the skull and bones thing. The atonement of Christos as interpreted by the Old Testament sacrificial types, there are these necessary elements. One, the sacrifice of Christos, of the Moshiach, our black Lord, it is substitutionary where the offering takes the offerer's place in death. You understand? In the moat. In Moet, remember Ahare Mot, that's this particular 29th um, Torah portion reading and feeding. Secondly, the law, which is Torah, is not evaded. See, the, the, the Torah is not, the, the law of Jah, Jah law can't be evaded, but it can be honored. In other words, it can be what? Glorified. That word honored refers to glorified. Remember Christ spoke about when he is glorified, when he is glorified. His glorification you understand, did not evade the law, you understand, but the, every sacrificial death was an execution of the sentence of law until that perfect sacrifice to fulfill all the types would come and has come in our blessed Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach. Now, thoroughly the sinlessness of him, the fact that Yeshua was sinless, without sin. In other words, that's like saying before heaven, he was not a criminal. But we all, because of, because of that Adamic thing, that damn Adamic thing, you understand, we all have inherited that. Now, of course, folks have a lot of dispute about that, and I will point to the Cannabis Matrix, the book that we just published. Please take a look at it. You may not agree with it, but it presents an interesting, and, and not a Rastafari, the writer did not write it from a Rastafari perspective. We have seen it in the Rastafari, in the eye of Rastafari, and this is why we present the Cannabis uh, Matrix. So that kind of goes into a little bit more of the, the sacrifice of, of, of Christ and, and the fulfillment, you understand, of Christ being sacrificed on that tree. So the sinlessness of him who bore our sins is expressed in every animal sacrifice. So every animal sacrifice, and we went through this in, in previous um, Rastafari, the RSSs and the Rastafari Sabbatical Studies, speaking on the five, remember the, that number, there were five types of, of animal sacrifice must be without blemish, must be without any sort of blemish. Now, fourthly, the effect of the atoning work of Christos, the atoning work of the Mushia, what is the effect? The effect is typified, A, in the promises, in the tesfa, in the tesfa. It shall be what? It shall be forgiven him. It shall be forgiven him and be in the peace, the salam offering or the hotep offering, the expression of what? Fellowship. See, that's what the idea in the New Testament comes in that, that um, Christ, um, Christ has caused many brothers to come forward. In other words, Christ being that first begotten has brought forth many more brothers. So he was like that catalyst, you understand, that catalyst for the restoration of true brotherhood as Yeshua HaMoshiach, even in this present time for I and I as a once lost but now found Beta Israel, he is that peace offering, the expression of true fellowship, of true wendamamachne, the wendamamachne fikr, the true brotherly love. Because what the Christ says that um, there's no greater love 
than a, a man laying down his life for his friends. You understand? For his for his brethren. You always I was reading earlier um in his majesty's um speech and let me see if it's right here because if it's right here it'll be very interesting to kind of point to that. I think we have it right here. Let's see. Okay, actually it is right here. It is um investiture of bishops and at a more advanced level of um Rastafari uh teaching. Um we can connect the teaching of his majesty. We're just going through some basic what we call Kidner Garden, right? And this particular speech right here from November third, nineteen fifty nine, here the articulation, right? Here the utterance of his Imperial Majesty he says, Our preoccupations, however, have not been concerned solely with the material welfare of our people. We have already mentioned our activities in the field of education. The development of the resources of intelligence which education draws forth from our people. Notice, education draws this out of us, not somehow else putting it into us, but it's drawing it out of us, vital as it is. Without moral inspiration and guidance, can never of itself work for the good of all. So, as Matt is pointing something very interesting out to us right here um, in um, his uh, selected speeches, which we also have available if one seeks to order the selected speeches of his Imperial Matthew Haile Selassie. This exact book is, um, is, is available, it's up there. And what we're pointing to right here on. Um, on page, uh, what page is this? On page uh, 633, His Majesty is making a very important um, word here. And it's under religion. But you have to remember that in the Amharic, in the Ethiopic, when we say so-called, quote, religion, in our language, we say hymenot, which has a deeper and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, 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 a more relevant meaning to the true um service of man than the Roman Latin religio. So please understand that some say religion, so forth and so on, but religion in English does not mean the same thing in the Ethiopic nor in the Hebrew. You understand? And that's something that a lot of folks don't know. And in, in the Western it's like the word religion is 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 a placeholder for something much higher in concept. We say hymenot. Hymenot means the living faith. But as Matthew says that our preoccupations, his and those working with him, and I and I who will also work through him, however, are not concerned solely with material welfare, the material welfare of our people. You know, um, speaking about material things that we do need, you understand? We have already mentioned our activities in the field of education. So education is a particular field of his majesty's activity, therefore, must be also of our, especially this generation of Rastafari's activity, the development of the resources of intelligence which education draws. Look at that. Resources of intelligence. This is how you study his majesty. Resources of intelligence are, are, are drawn from the people by education. Vital that is, as that is without the moral inspiration, you know, the moral theocracy, you know, remember that idea of true Rastafari, moral theocracy? Without moral inspiration and what guidance? Without moral inspiration and guidance. So although many say, I and I not deal with religion. Okay, maybe not from a Western perspective or a Western Gentile um, um, disorientation, you understand, know or, 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 or misunderstanding, but you then have to learn what hymenote means. You understand? So we're not dealing with the word religion, but I and I dealing with hymenote, which is truly higher and truer religion from the perspective of the King of Kings and His Christ in our pure um, language. You understand? So that's very important just to, to lay that particular out. But religion, even so, is necessary. I'm pointing this out because a lot of folks, we, we, we say we're not dealing with this, okay, religion means that in, in English. But what does it mean in Ethiopic? What's the word that His Majesty, in His Majesty's version, and, and in Ethiopia, when we see this word religion, what is that word? You see, when you start to seek that, then you really are, are beginning to seek your true roots. But His Majesty is telling us here in plain English 
that even as vital as education is, without moral inspiration and guidance can never of itself work for the good of all. It might work for the good of some. That's why even education in the West is so messed up, because it's not working for the good of all. It's only working those who make, those who went to school or whatever, are just thinking about paying off their student loans and doing their own thing. Yeah, they might have some idea of helping others, but they've already become a slave. You see what I'm saying? By that very system that they blindly serve. But as Matt says something here that this is the reason why I point to this, where he says, man who is by nature selfish. You see this? Man who is by nature selfish. Did you get this right here? Man who is by nature selfish must learn, must learn that only in serving others can he reach the full stature or attain the noble destinies, our true noble destinies for which God, the true God, right, and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Shua HaMoshiach, created him. We have therefore spared no effort to encourage and sustain the church in its highest mission of preserving and inculcating into the youth those spiritual values and ideals, this is what is missing, the true spiritual values and ideals which for centuries, speaking of Ethiopia now, have guided the destinies of our beloved people. It was in consequence with deep gratification that during those past years we were able to bring about the full recognition of the Ethiopian church as the autocephalous and national church of the empire, the church which through centuries of struggle and martyrdom has pursued its task of evangelism and education has our continued support. November 3rd, one day after Coronation Day, 19. 59. Now, this speech, there's so much in this, and, and this is a lecture and a meditation for each individual and a, and, and a reasoning for ones and ones coming together, a beautiful, sweet reasoning for those who, who are of the maturity, you understand, to, to come together and reason. Man who, by, who is by nature selfish. Look what we're saying. Man by his nature is selfish. But he must learn, in other words, he must grow, you understand, into what? Understanding that only in serving others can he reach the full stature or, or maintain, attain, attain the noble destinies, even attain them. This is what we're reclaiming. When we talk about reclaiming our name and we talk about reclaiming our birthright and our nationhood, you understand, we have to keep this word of wisdom in our hearts and minds so we can attain our noble destinies for which God created him in the first place. Now, the reason for us going there is to kind of link both the, the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice of Yeshua HaMoshiach on the word of the cross or the word of the tree, you understand that tree, the Bible points out that tree particularly, and we understand more through the cannabis matrix and the study from that revelation, the more fulfillment of it. But without this foundation, that revelation is vain. So we need this foundation. We need this scriptural, this biblical foundation right here. So Christ fulfilled that. You know what I'm saying? Christ fulfilled that. So it says, what man soever there be, verse 2, of the house of Israel, notice it says in verse 2 of, um, in fact, uh, pray, I, 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 my page, my page turned, in fact, okay, yeah, the page turned, my bad, I was in chapter 17 right there, um, because it was on the notes to chapter 16, it says, all right, so there was an A part and a B part where we left off, it was the effect of the atoning work of Christos. Is, is typified in the promises it shall be forgiven him and be in the peace offering, which is the expression of fellowship, and that's the highest privilege of the saint. Now, what is the saint? See, next, next uh, sabbatical, um, number 30, is dealing with Kedoshim, or Kedusan. Kedusan is holy ones. It means the holy ones. Kedus is an individual holy. And now, the, the, the right or privilege to the um, 
kedisana, to that kedisana holiness, um, to that holiness, um, um, uh, to, to holiness is not, or to being a saint is not determined by the Catholic or the Romanist. That's what many of y'all have been taught. That's what many of y'all have believed, and that's the reason why they've kept you biblically ignorant. You understand? Because if you read in the Bible, you'll see that anyone who seeks to live godly, you understand, who consciously seeks to live godly and submit themselves to our black Lord, to Yeshua, to Adoni, in spirit, you understand, and in truth. That means in spirit, in, in, in the spirit of their heart and mind, and in truth is the part that means we have to learn the truth. We have to study and show ourselves approved. Is in the is in the house of the Kedus. He is in, he or she is in the house of the Kedus. See, holy means to separate yourself, plain and simply. But the Catholic Church and modern um, anti-Christian or Christianities have totally confused the issue. And our authority is the word, you understand, is the scripture, and is the true um, 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 Christian, Judaic, Jewish, and Christian uh, history. You understand, be as witness. And we can point to much reference from our own Ethiopian, you understand, and black root as 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 uh Hebrews, you know what I'm saying, and as anointed Hebrews or Hebrew followers of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, with the new name as Aras Tefari. You know what I'm saying? The new name Rastafari. You have to understand now the connection with that because he says my name has been continually blasphemed. We look at history of Christianity and we can see that the true the the true teachings of Christ, you understand, the true teaching of Christ also have been blasphemed. You understand, the true teaching of Christ also have been blasphemed. Let's see if we um, have a, 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 a crucifixion picture right here. Because what we're showing you really is the skull and bones right there. You understand? So now with that particularly in mind, that needs to be a... a uh, uh, there needs to be that connection because if, if you are reading Old Testament without the light of Christ, that means without the truth of the gospel. What does the New Testament say? You are you are reading that. You understand? You are reading that with a veil. You understand? With a veil over your eyes. You understand? You are really reading that with a veil over your eyes. So now it's very. Is very um, interesting, and it's very, it's very interesting, and it's very important that as we go on in this particular section right here, um, Leviticus chapter sixteen, it's going to speak to us about, um, it's speaking to us about Aaron, right? That Yahweh Jah told Moses to speak to Aaron, your brother that he come not at all times to the holy place. So what was said to Aaron, Haron, and we can say this is a symbol of, of, of Aaron, that Aaron come not at all times to the holy place. You understand? And the holy place is what we call the Kedusa Kedusan, or in the Hebrew, the Kodesh Ha Kodeshim. The Kodesh or the Kodesh Ha Kodeshim. So this text right here tells us of the ritual of Yom Kippur. It's laying the foundation for what Yeshua HaMoshiach would fulfill. You understand? Would fulfill. After the death of Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Ha Elohim or Yahweh, Elohe Israel, he told Moses to tell Aaron not to come at will. In other words, up until this time, right? Up until this time, Haron or Aaron, right? Aaron basically could 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 go into the holy place whenever he wanted to. He could go into the holy of holies almost whenever he wanted to. But it's very clear now after the death of his two sons that Yahweh is saying through Moses to tell his brother, Moses' brother, Haron, not to come at all times, you understand, to the holy place or to the Kodesh Ha Kodeshim. Now, you know, we can study this and, and it's good to just think about this for a moment. Are you putting this in context? Aaron's two sons just died. Aaron's two sons were playing the priests. 
they went into the holy place. You understand? They they um they 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 were using strange fire. They lit strange fire. They used strange fire. They were consumed. They died. Now, in this next chapter, what do we find? In this next chapter, we find Yahweh now communicating a message now to um to Aaron through Moses, telling him basically um not to come whenever you want to. Don't come into, you know, the presence whenever you want to. Now, there's more to that, but just think about that for a moment. Because, remember, these are the two sons of Aaron. You know what I mean? The two sons of Aaron. They almost remind me of Eli's. Remember Eli's two sons, which are in, in the book of, I think, Samuel, speaks about Eli's two sons. At least they die for Jah, Yahweh, appeared in the clouds here. Now, 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 now notice something. Yahweh appears, right? He he appears in a cloud. You understand? He appears in a cloud. For I will appear in a cloud upon the mercy seat. So so he's saying basically to check check this out. Um, Yahweh is saying to 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 Moses, tell your brother basically whose two sons died. You understand? Because that's how this portion begins off. Ahare mot. Your your two sons who died. To tell your brother, you understand, um, not to come into the tabernacle or, or, or to the holy place whenever you feel like it. Because I'm going to appear, you understand, I'm going to manifest myself in a cloud. You understand, in, a, in, 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 the, in the Shekinah or the Shekinah, the shock and awe, the, the cloud, where? Over the mercy seat. Where? Over the mercy seat. Now, um, we, we don't have that picture right now to show you what the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant is or what artists have um, thought it to look like, but we know that the mercy seat has a great significance in the New Testament. So in order to understand where it says that Christ, he now gives us access. We have access now to the presence of God the Father the God and Father of our black Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMoshiach, that now in Christ and through Christ, through, through the faith in spirit and in truth, we have access into the presence. But at this time in the Belui Kidan, that continual access that we have, Hebrews teaches us this, that we have into the presence, you know what I'm saying, through, through Christ and, and even due to that blood, symbolically speaking, you know what I'm saying? That blood of, of Christ. We have access now to the Father. You know what I'm saying? In other words, we have fellowship. This is what Christ is speaking about in the New Testament. In his high priest, in, in, in his high priest prayers. The high priest prayers we find in John 16, I think in 17. The high priestly prayers of Yeshua Ha Moshiach. That, that that's that's where he he now is is going into that high priestical function. You know what I'm saying? The high priestical function. So Yahweh is gonna appear in the mercy seat. It says, Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place. In other words, this is how Aaron has to come into the holy place. So um symbolically this can represent a Aaron type figure. You understand know this particular figure right here, we represent the Aaron type figure. Here he's ministering at the altar of, of Aishans, at the altar of, of incense. Yahweh now says in 16 and 3 of Leviticus, he says that thus, which means like this, shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So he said that Aaron can come into the Kodesh Ha Kodeshim with a young bullock, you understand? A young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat. You understand? He shall put on the holy linen, the aphoot. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen breeches. You understand? The linen breeches or pants. Right upon his flesh, and shall be girded with a linen girdle. So you see the linen girdle, right here. He shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with a linen mitre. The mitre, you understand? We we, we call it crown today, the tam, right? But the but the mitre, or the or, or the head covering, or the turban, shall he be attired. These are the holy garments 
Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. So it's saying he's going to wear this, but first he's going to have to wash his flesh. He's going to have to bathe. He's going to have to, symbolically speaking, baptize. Now, now you understand now how this links also with the the main um, spiritual metaphysical science that, that God in Christ is showing us through the Word. In other words, it's showing us now an Old Testament type of bathing or baptizing or bathing, you understand, in connection with this entrance and access into, into the holy place. Verse 5 says, And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats. You understand, there was two young ones of the goats for a sin offering and one for a, 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 a burnt offering. And one for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. So one might would ask, why all of these um, these animals? Why this one and that one? Well, as we study this, we're actually finding out what each of them, you understand, what each of them in the Old Testament sense was for. But now as we compare with books like or, or epistles like Hebrews, and we start to study how Christ, the Moshiach, fulfilled the Old Testament um, uh, uh, symbols and, and, and the types were fulfilled in Christ. It makes such a, a beautiful metaphysical understanding because what we're learning is type, type, typology, you understand, symbolism, you understand, and the living interpretation now of symbolism and what these types were signifying what they were signifying of that which was more perfect. You understand? That which was more perfect to come. It's like when Christ turned the water to wine and the the master of the house said that you've left the best for last. You understand? You've left the best for last. This also is proven in, in, in and remember Cana, Cana, the Cana Bosom of Galilee, that was the first it's interesting because that was the first, um, that was what we can call the first miracle. That is said in the scriptures to be one of the first um, miracles, you know, the the Kana, the, the, the Kana, which is basically Kana as, as when we say Kana bus, that's what the Kana is. You know, don't. You know, don't accept my word for it. Look it up. You'll find that many people will try to tell you it's not that. It's another kind of read, so forth and so on. Almost like the people didn't have it, uh, and almost like the people didn't use it. But if that was so, we would find something in the word. We'll find something in ancient writing. It's only modern man who is so dis spiritually disorientated, upside down, that that would fight against it and be so confused about the real meaning of the cannabis. You understand, or the Kana Bush, you understand, and the connection even here with the altar of Aishans. You see, with the altar of Aishans. So, here it says that the Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. He shall make an atonement for himself, right, and for, for his, his, his house. Now, we can see the link when we go to Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 9, and, and we, we, hopefully we can get into that aspect right here. What we want to focus on at this particular time, let's bring this one up right here. What we want to focus on right here is the, the two goats, right? So here we can, you can see the bullock right here, you know, or the consecration, the bullock, or the priest with their hands on the bullock, you understand? Now, here we have the scapegoat, you understand? There's two goats. Now, what we noticed that was immediately interesting about this whole idea of the, of the two goats is when we look at goats today. Let's look at goat today. Well, all of you all probably are, are well familiar with this. You've seen this, right? You've seen this symbol before, you understand? Well, this is one of the goats. This is actually one of the goats. You understand? This is it, it, it gives a new meaning to, 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 to what we say when we say kill it. 
You understand? Know but 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 here, this is the scapegoat that is let go to Azazel. This is the scapegoat that is let go to Azazel. So once we go through some of the prefunctories, right, the basics of this chapter, where Aaron is only to enter after bathing in water, he's to dress in the sacred or the sacral linen, the linen tunic breeches, the sash, the turban, and he's to bring a bull for a sin offering, two rams for a burnt offering, and two he goats for a sin offering, Leviticus sixteen three to five. Aaron was to take the two goats to the entrance of the tabernacle and place lots upon them, one marked for the Lord and the other for Azazel. You understand? The other was to be marked for Azazel. So we have in this chapter right here, really the whole root of a whole bunch of so-called, um, people call it uh, stuff going on today like occultism. You understand? Most folks don't even understand the real scriptural overcoming of, of occultism. You understand? Because a lot of it's really based in the scriptures. You know, it's in the true orientation. What people have now is a is a disorientation because what they don't even recognize is that there were two goats here. One goat is for the Lord, right? And by contrast, one goat is for the devil or or an angel. One can say an angel by the name. Some say Azazel is an angel. Now, also going along, going along with this. Um, particular um, uh, thema here. Let's bring this over here. Let's bring this down here. Now, this is this is we'll get it, we'll get into that in a moment. This is Aaron's sons right there. I think there's another picture that we okay. Maybe it's not that picture right there. Now here, what we have is the Denderago. Very interesting. You, you you might recognize who this is too. You understand Denderago. You know what I'm saying? Dender a goat. This is um the a typhonian animal, right? Typhon in Hebrew will be Zaphon. Zaphon in Hebrew will be mystery. You know what I'm saying? So this is this mysterious, mythical creature that was sacrificed to Sut or Seth. Not Seth the son of of Adam, you know what I'm saying, who replaced um Abel, but to another Seth, to the Egyptian Sut. You understand know that's found in the pectorials and the tomb inscriptions throughout e Egypt. Now, the interesting thing about this is that there's a connection with a star system named um, Lepus Asterim. You understand? Know or the stars of Lepus. You understand? Know Here's the Dendera goat. Now, they say it's kind of a mythical composite, but the interesting thing about it is that it is a goat. You understand? And this goat was sacred. Notice this goat was sacred to the um, to the suit Typhonians. Now, it's very interesting that they Hebrews now, you understand, in their ritual, you understand, in their particular ritual, would sacrifice one goat to Yahweh, right? And then one goat... You understand? Goes in the wilderness to Azazel. And it's, it's also very interesting that Christ will say, give unto what? Caesar. You understand? What is Caesar's? And give unto God what is God. Or give unto God what is God. Jah what is Jah's. And give unto Caesar what is Caesar. First give to Jah. So the first one was given to Yahweh. And then the other one was led out into the wilderness. Now, there's, there's, there's more to this. We want to just point you out that this is here in the scriptures. If you look in your Bibles and the bad thing about um, some of the translations like the King James uh, translation is if you go to, um, let's read through this, verse 7, and he shall take the two goats and present them before Yahweh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot, or, or we could say almost dice, he shall roll the dice on the two goats. So one lot is for Yahweh, and one lot is for the scapegoat. Now, that is um, Leviticus 16 and 8. Leviticus 16 and 8. Let's bring up the Blue Letter Bible for a moment. We want to show you something very interesting right here. So let's go down to uh, uh, chapter 16. Now, what you have is the King James Version. 
you have another um, New World kind of uh, version, and then you have the Hebrew. You understand? And now right here, if you look at it, what you probably see in your Bibles if you're reading a, a King James version of the Bible is that you might see scapegoat. All you're going to see is scapegoat, right? If we look at the H5799, we'll see that it has the name Az Azal, Azazel, Azazal, Azazel, Azazel, right? And that's the goat of what? Departure. Azazel is the goat of departure or otherwise known as the scapegoat. So let's go right here. And let's go back to this right here and bring this up right here in, in the in the Ethiopic. Now, what's interesting in the Ethiopic, right? In the Ethiopic, it has um, not Azazel as a name, right? But it says Lemi Lekek to the one that is let go, similar to the idea of the goat of departure. It says Aronim Behuletu. A fialoch lie, it a yit la bachual, undun it a le exiavihir, le launim it a le milek. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for Yahweh or for exiavihir, the sustainer, and the other for the scapegoat. Now, let's, let's move this down and look at the KJV with the Strong's number. Let's look at the scapegoat right here. So you'll see it a little better right here. You see Azazel, Azazale, Azazale. And he says from two parts, 5795 and the 235. And it's the goat of departure, the scapegoat. But let's look at the 5795 for a moment. The 5795 is, is Ez or Aze. Ez or Aze. Now, what does it say for Ez or Aze right here? It says it's from the 58, 5810. It's a she goat as strong, but masculine in plural. But in a plural sense, it's masculine, which also is used um, for like the goats. Um, and a euphemistic word for the goats here. You understand? The goats here. Uh, a she goat, a goat, or a goat kid, like a young goat, right? But then we also know, you understand, from the so called occult world, you understand, or through the so called occultic use, we also know that Azazel would be the equivalent of the, of the, 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 the Hebrew, um, Goat of Mendes. Now, this is a page right here that we picked up on the Internet. Some of y'all probably have um, maybe seen it or seen something like it. And it's talking about so-called witchcraft and magic spells books and so forth and so on. And if you wonder why, you understand, the goat, the goat of Mendes, the Mendes goat, the sigil of Baphomet, or the they call it the Sabbatic goat, is used, the real key to the mystery is found right here in Leviticus. You understand? That means that there is something deeper that's going on. Remember, there's one goat that is sacrificed to Yahweh and another one that is let go into the wilderness. One that is just let go. In I mean, what is and what was the understanding of the Beta Israel? And then we have to ask ourselves, then what is also the connection you understand, with the goat, you understand, even the goat hand sign or the ill canudo, you know, hand sign, so forth and so on. Now, here they tell you a lot of psycho babble, you understand, about what the goat means for them. It's interesting, but don't, don't get too caught up on it, just, just as a data, you understand, because there's some things either they don't tell you, you know, and there's some things that they basically don't really know. So here is the goat. Notice. Here is the goat that is let go into the wilderness, that is let go into the wilderness. Now, think about this carefully. Christ was in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And in the wilderness where he was there for 40 days and 40 nights, guess who else apparently was out there too? Diablos, the devil. 
Now, the Hebrews have a goat, right? One goat they sacrifice to Yahweh, you understand? Know and the next goat they just let go out into the wilderness, you understand, know to Azazel. So who is Azazel? Now, they say, well, Azazel is the, is the one that is let go, the one that is, is, is let go. Now, the word uh, lekek, lemi lekek, can also mean in the sense of like if somebody loses their job. You see what I'm saying? They're let go. You understand? Even the Israelites wanting to be let go use that very same symbology. They use lekek, in other words, you know, um, likek, you know, his being likek, let, them, let my people go. You understand? Like, release them, let them go, because they were they were under slave labor, so to say. You understand? Or under a barnet, a bondage, religious, and social system. Similar to where we're at right now as lost sheep, thinking we're free, when emancipate means to make over as property, legally speaking. So we want to kind of dovetail to that particular issue. But at the, at, at the crux of this, you know what I'm saying? At the crux of this is Christ. At the crux of all this is Christ. Now, when we, um, let's see if we could bring up that particular picture again and, and show you this. We, we showed it in, um, in, in another one of our, uh, let's see, in another one of our presentations um, where, you know, Christ was crucified. We talked on this before. Okay, we have this picture here. Christ was crucified in what they call the place of the skull. You understand? Christ was crucified in the place of the skull or the place that was known as um, Golgotha, right, Golgotha. Now, that is, that is not just um, literary um, poetry. You understand? There's, there is a great theological and metaphysical overstanding in that particular symbology. You understand? In that particular symbology. And the fact that we as a lost sheep are in the valley of, uh, I mean, we're, we're in the valley of death, yes. You know, we're, we're it's like the valley of, of skull and bones. The valley of the dry bones, or we can call it the valley of skull and bones. This is where we're at. We're in the valley of death. But you see how Christ's sacrifice, even in this pictorial representation of the mysteries, overcomes that. You understand? He gains the victory. He, all enemies are under the what? The feet, the black feet of Christ. This is very, very significant. So what we see is a process of the people of God, you understand, growing, you understand, not just growing, but maturing, you understand, through blood, sweat, and tears, you understand, into their fullness. And this is another example of who we are and the true way, the truth, and the life. So here, the feet of Christ, you understand, the feet of Christ over his enemies have become his footstool. You see, his enemies, that means death has been overcome. Death, where is your sting? You see, so the Bible tells us he was crucified in the place of the skull. And then we see that the place of the skull, you understand, when we put the place of the skull into its proper proportion, you understand, in the, in the um, evidently setting forth, in other words, in Christ being crucified as he's evidently set forth, you see that he has overcome death. So these pictures, you know, the pictures and, and, the, and, the, and the true mystical, accurate paintings of Christ, they do teach us much. You understand? They do teach us much. You know, you hear them talking about da Vinci and so forth and so on. You know, and many of them were trying to demonstrate sometime in pictures, you know, saying in art, that which was, was contrary to the popular um, European or Western theology. You understand, uh, Western theology of the time. Now, the Israelites had to move away from, from imagery because, in a sense, the imagery had gotten so perverted that one had to get back into the Word. This is one of the reasons why imagery, you understand, was more tightly regulated, you understand, especially in, in the Hebrew, in the early Hebraic, because they were coming out of a place where they were exposed to an inversion. You understand? An inversion of, of, of the true Yahweh's religion that one time was worshipped in Egypt, coming out of Ethiopia, you understand, before the fall of humanity. 
You know, saying before the fall of the black man, in other words. So basically, we're coming, we're coming full circle again. When you look at the full history, the big picture of humanity, we're coming full cipher. You understand? Know and hopefully, we have consciously, you know, accepted the truth. That means that we would be worth the process. You understand? Know worth the process. Those who have consciously accepted the truth of the gospel. You know what I'm saying? And have actualized it. And who have actualized it. So we add this skull and bones right here to basically help ones to understand the real significance. Because most folks just have Christ on the cross. You understand? We in his true humanity as black, others according to their ethnic, you know, their ethnicity, and seeing Christ in their own image, like what was done with Buddha, so forth and so on. But regardless of that, people have to receive Christ in his true humanity. But they also must know the truth that he's black, you see, because that would be lying to the reality of it. Some folks don't like that because they built a big industry on the whitewashed lies. You understand? They've, they, they've built um, their own deity, you understand, on co-opting the deity of Yeshua, HaMoshia. Now, what we have here in this particular Torah portion with that being said and somewhat and somewhat um, illuminated on, we have the two goats. So in the Hebrew sense, I want to put this to, to you, that, the, that this is one goat for Yahweh, right? And this is the one for Azazel. And I'm giving you this image right here, this image of the Dendera goat. And, 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 and it says down here that this was a, 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 a suit typhonian, this was a suit typhonian um, creature, you know, a, 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 a creature that was sacred to Shet or Shut or, or Sut or Seth. Not the, not the Adamic Seth, but the Egyptian Seth. And there's, a, there's, a, there's an important point there. Some might ask, well, why not so? You understand? Well, Seth originally, Seth was originally good. Seth became bad. Now, and, and, and now explaining that historically and going through the ancient religions, we can see the turning point right here with the Israelites. You see, the Israelites coming out of Egypt was a key turning point. It was to preserve the remnant of the true faith. So some Egyptologists and some of the brothers and sisters who are into Rahab and Egypt to the level that they are, it's hard for them to recognize it. But they know that the root and the truth came out of, uh, out of ancient Ethiopia, you see. And this is why it returns to Ethiopia to show the fullness of that sothic, that so-called sothic cycle. You understand? And at the heart of that, we know, is the king of kings. It's Kedemawi, Haile Selassie, and we are that revelation of it. So, with that being said, my brothers and sisters, I hope I didn't digress uh, um, too much there. But keeping this in this context, Aaron now, he takes these two goats to the entrance of the tabernacle. He places lots on them, and we know one is for Yahweh, the other is for Azazel. Aaron was to offer the goat designated for Yahweh as the sin offering. So now among the goat, the goat that was dedicated for Yahweh, right, is the sin offering, the chatiyat, the missing of the mark offering. And then he was to send off into the wilderness. Into the, now, brothers and sisters, according to our former teachers and warners and those who were trying to lift up this lost sheep, they said we are where the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he said it best, he says we're in the wilderness of North America. You see, we're in the wilderness right now. Now, where was the other goat sent? The other goat was sent where? To the wilderness. See, even, even the so-called white folks in English don't know even why they even really, they have their ideas why they came to America. All that was to fulfill a bigger, a greater mystery and prophecy. This is the wilderness people. So we have one goat, you understand, being sacrificed as a sin offering, right? And the other goat now being sent to the wilderness and is designated for some one Hebraically named Azazel. Some say Azazel in the book, the Ethiopian book of Enoch is really one of the names of the fallen angels. Some say this was a particular fallen angel. So we have to ask the question, well, why was a goat being sent to him? What was up with that? Is it a manifestation of the two truths? 
on some sort of level. In other words, give unto God, things that are God, give unto uh, Caesar, things that are Caesar. Is, is it a precursor of that? Aaron was then to offer the bull of sin offering. And then later on in, in verse 11, when we look at verse 11, we have this right here. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. So now he offers one. This is where Hebrews talk about how the priest had to offer, you know, even one for himself. You understand? So let's just bring this up to, to, to keep this in perspective. So, so Aaron, right, an Aaron type, a type of pictorial visual Aaron, has to now offer offer the bull. We don't have a bull image right here. The bull, he has to offer a a a bull in that sense for himself. We might be able to do that within this. Well, right here, this is like a ram right here. So we don't have a bull right here to show you. But you you know what a bull it looks like, and you know the type myth mythologically, the horns and all of that that's associated ancient Egypt. There's the bull, and the Egyptians were said to worship the bull, or in the later animist phase, you know what I'm saying, as man was regaining his consciousness. Let's understand that. Aaron was to take part of the glowing coals from the altar and two handfuls of incense of the Aishans, and put the Aishans on the fire before the most holy place. Before the most holy place. So now, he is to take some of the coals and the fire, and put it before the most holy place, which means before the ark, you understand, before the, we can say the ark of the covenant, so that the cloud from the incense, now this is what's particularly very interesting. Mm -hmm. So that the cloud from the incense, right, the cloud from the incense would, um, would, would screen the Ark of the Covenant, Leviticus 16, 12 to 13. So he was to take some of the coals, right? Now, this is interesting because here we think is the proper way of, of going into the tabernacle that the sons of Aaron probably feeling that they're part of the priestly family. You know what I mean? You know, we call borrowed honor. You understand they're part of the priestly family. Like sometimes we might even meet ones who say they they knew his majesty, or, or they, or even if they're part of his majesty's family. You understand? We're looking for righteousness. You see, make that make 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 that be understood, because you might favor men and people because of admiration of person, and this is also part of that whole strange fire thing, because they did not have one ounce or one lick. Of instruction. So now here we have the Ark of the Covenant also being mentioned now in relation here. Let's see if we have any any pictures of the Ark mm -hmm. of the Covenant in this context that we can um, show you. Mm. We might not, but most of you know the position of the Ark of the Covenant. So he's actually burning this incense right in that in. Before the veil, let's call it before the veil that is of the Ark of the Covenant, so that what? So that the Ark of the Covenant will be screened by what? By smoke. You understand? So that the Ark of the Covenant, you understand, would be screened, you understand, by by smoke. Let's see if we could bring up a a a, a pick of the a pick of the Ark um the Ark of the Covenant, and if we even have a uh, 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 where you can see the veil. It would be good if we had a pic where you can see the veil of the Ark of the Covenant, too, so you can get a good idea on the approximate position. I mean, we've, we've been touching, that's what we've been touching on the tabernacle, um, you know, the tabernacle before, you understand, and in the portions where we've talked, touched on the construction, you understand, the construction of the tabernacle 
Um, well, let's let, let's bring this up. Let's bring up this Ark of the Covenant pick right here. This is uh, this is one Ark of the Covenant pick. So he's to do what? Let's show it, demonstrate like this. So Aaron, right? Aaron. Now notice where he's at. Aaron is to burn the incense, right? To burn the incense. Mm -hmm. To get some coals of fire, some some coals, right, from the altar, and to get some ashes and to burn it here so that the Ark of the Covenant would be screened by the smoke. So the Ark of the Covenant will be screened by the smoke. And this is now very, very interesting because it's showing a certain ritual order. But as we look at the big picture, it, it, it really begins to make more and more um, perfect perfect sense. So that means that Yahweh did not intend that one just could gaze, in other words, on the Ark of the Covenant. One could not gaze on the Ark of the Covenant. However, one could look through the sanctuary, you understand, look through the sanctuary place and would see that cloud of what? Of smoke. Now, notice something about that cloud of smoke. Let's, let's enlarge in this one. This is another view of the Ark of the Covenant, right? That, that they would um, be, behold that cloud of smoke. So this is a, a kind of a likeness of, of, of what, you know, what was going on. So, so behind this curtain right here, behind this curtain, in other words, would be the Ark of the Covenant. This would be directly in, in front of this. You see, this would be directly in front of this with the veil. The veil would be there, but you could see through. You understand? Some say you can see through the veil. Some debate that the veil was not that see seeable through. And even if it was seeable through, Aaron here is now commanded to take the incense in here and to and to um, burn the incense in order to screen. You understand? To screen the Ark of the Covenant. Isn't that the cloud? Isn't that similar to the cloud on sun? Even though you said the cloud on the mercy seat, it's another type of a cloud. Leviticus 16, verses 12, verses 12 to 13, and it says, And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of what sweet ancients, sweet incense beaten small, broken down small, and bring it within the veil. He will bring it, notice what it says, he will bring it now within the veil. Mm -hmm. Now, one says before the veil, the other says in the veil, and we can look at the, the Ethiopic to get the, the more accurate of this. But now we know it's sweet Aishans. Mm -hmm. And we know that it says within, bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before Yahweh, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. So we actually are learning here by looking at the Jews in their version kind of imply that it's just before. So we're now using our God-given, God-given intellect to find the truth for ourselves. We actually are reading that he will go into, you understand, the veil. So he's going to enter into the veil. Remember, this is all connected with Yom Kippur. He's going to enter into the veil. Mm -hmm. He's going to enter into the veil. So he's taking some of the incense, most likely from here, the, 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 right, before the Lord, right? And he's entering into the veil, and he's going to put it right here on the mercy seat. But it says he has to do this so he does the what not. He does not die because it's after the death of his two sons. And what a shame it will be for his two sons to die and for him also to die. But his two sons died, you understand, because of rebelliousness. You know, because of rebelliousness, Aaron lost his two sons. But yet, notice this, he continued to serve Yahweh. He can, now, now, now I, I point to that. I mentioned a little bit earlier, but I point to that to make us think. You know, make us think about things in the world that may mean something that we have lost, 
You understand? And to also recognize what our divine and sacred duty still is. Because it wasn't, he didn't blame, Aaron didn't blame Yahweh. You understand? He didn't blame Moses. He knew that the blame was on his rebellious sons. You see, and, and there's, a, there's, 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 a, there's an important point to learn and, and to be learned in that. Make a note, make a footnote on that. And, and it probably will be a very good thing also to kind of um, teach your children as well. You understand? Because they, got, they did something without any instruction. You understand? They did something without any instruction. Something that they should have already been cautioned about. Now, one might debate whether Aaron, you understand, because remember, Aaron seems to have a track record. You understand? Aaron seems to have a little track record here because, um, you know, we know that there's the incident with the golden calf, you know, that's going on and that had happened. And now we have this incident with, um, with, with, with Aaron and his, and his sons. So it, it might make one wonder, but just remember that these uh, children, you understand, these children obviously, you understand, were, 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 were old enough, you understand, and here's the picture right here, Aaron's two sons, you understand, Aaron's two sons. So we see that they're at the altar of incense burning strange fire, and they died. 